Netcat is often called the Swiss army knife of network utilities. It's one of those tools that's perfect in its simplicity and its design. But what is Netcat and where did it come from? We'll answer those questions and more in this episode of the InfoSec Toolshed. Netcat was written by Hobbit and originally released in 1995. Not much is known about Hobbit, but according to his own publications, he adopted that name because he's often found not wearing shoes. In trying to understand the history of this wonderful utility, I first went and talked to the person who more than 20 years ago taught me about Netcat. Ed Scotus is the original author of SANS SEC 504 and SEC 560, which is famously the place that you want to go if you want to learn Netcat. Today, Ed is the president of SANS Technology Institute, where you can take SANS classes and get a bachelor's or a master's degree in information security. Ed also runs Counter Hack Challenges, which among other things, runs the annual Holiday Hack Challenge that continues to teach people around the world about tools like Netcat. Ed has probably taught more people than anyone else in the world about Netcat, so it only seems appropriate that he's our first stop in trying to learn more about this wonderful tool. Hey, Ed, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thank you, Mark. Thanks very much for joining us. I appreciate it. Uh, why don't you give us a little bit of background on Netcat? What is it and how does it work? Sure. To understand Netcat and how really useful it is, it's helpful to remember some great fundamental concepts pioneered with Unix way back in the day, 30, 40 years ago. Unix, and then later Linux, has this concept of small, really simple tools that do just one thing and do it really well. These tools often have simple names like CD for change directories, or LS for get a listing of a directory, or CAT for concatenate something to standard output. You can see CAT is a lot shorter than saying concatenate. And these tools interact with the user at the command line through something called standard in and standard out. Standard in is by default the keyboard. That's where you type things, right? And so when a program runs, the user can type things into standard in, and that's the keyboard, and the program receives the things that the user types and processes them, standard in. Standard out, by default, is the screen. So when the program wants to send information back to the user, it'll send it back to standard out, which the user will see displayed on the screen. That's fine, that's good. But the really cool thing about standard in and standard out is that you can redirect them. Instead of a program writing things to standard out to display them on a screen, the user can instruct the program to redirect its standard out by doing a greater than sign, saying redirect your standard out to a file. So that's cool. So we can store the output of a program into the file system just by redirecting its output. What's more, we can redirect standard in from a file using the less than symbol. The less than sign says, hey, get your standard in, not from the keyboard, but instead get it from the contents of the file. So that way, a command line tool can interact with the file system. So these redirects using greater than and less than allow us to connect individual command line tools to the file system. And there's another kind of redirect that is super cool. The most wonderful of these redirects is called a pipe, which is typed as a vertical bar on your keyboard. It allows you to run one command line program, which has its output on standard output. You can then pipe that output into the standard in of another program, allowing you to glue the two programs together. We essentially pipe the output of one program into the input of another, bypassing the file system altogether. It's wonderful. And that leads us to this concept of a pipeline of commands, where we connect these simple little commands together using redirects like pipes or greater than or less than, so we can kind of glue together command line tools and the file system. Now, while this pipeline stuff was all pioneered in Unix, it was later carried into Linux and even into Windows in shells like cmd.exe and PowerShell and more. It's awesome. Now, you might be saying, you know, what, what about Netcat? Where does that come in? Well, Netcat takes this whole concept and opens it up to the network. It allows you to connect standard in and or standard out or both to the network via TCP connection or via UDP packets. So you can take the standard out of a command and pipe that into Netcat, which is called NC for short, and shoot that output across the network. 
or you can use Netcat to listen on the network. And when data comes in from the network, it can send whatever comes in to the standard in of another command line tool. So in essence, with Pipes and Netcat, you can connect any program standard in or standard out to the network. Super, super flexible. So with redirects, the pipeline, and Netcat, we can now have amazingly flexible interactions between the programs that we use, the file system, and then also the network. That last piece, the one that Hobbit gave us, the network, is what Netcat brings to the party. It can glue together command line tools and the file system with the network, all using standard in and standard out and these redirects. And in hacking and pen testing, that flexibility lets us do all kinds of things. We could build relays to pivot around filtering. We can bounce from system to system. We can use Netcat, create a back door uh, using this option within Netcat called dash E so that we can execute a program after connection, making a backdoor shell. All kinds of cool stuff are possible with this fundamental idea of Netcat. Thank you for explaining that to us. You know, I, as I was looking into the creator of this tool, I came in my research across the fact that, you know, he presented in 1997 at DEF CON 5 with Munge about the weaknesses in Landman passwords and actually not only how they're stored and, and we all are very familiar with how those attacks work now, but also the network protocols and the weaknesses that existed in them. So it, it, even though Hobbit has definitely made his mark on information security with Netcat, you know, he's been a fixture in this industry for a very long time and has contributed many things beyond Netcat to it. I, I really enjoyed my conversations with Hobbit regarding the, the origins of this wonderful tool. Unfortunately, he's not going to be able to be here on the show in order to present his his origin story, but he did give me permission to take his written origin story and then to get a narrator to read that. So rather than me reading that, I, I think, you know, you having been the person who's probably taught more people Netcat than anyone else in the world, it would be amazing if you'd be willing to do that for me. Is that something I could get you to do for me, Ed? Uh, I'd be truly honored, Mark. Thank you for even asking. All right. Awesome. I want you to feel free to add your own commentary as we're going through this, but I also want our listeners to know when it's Ed speaking and when it's Ed channeling Hobbit. I'll have some visible indicator on the screen here so that people know when it's you and when it's Ed. That way you can feel free to uh, speak freely as Ed as we go. So I think this thing that I'm going to have on the screen right here this is going to be your visible indicator that what you're hearing is Ed speaking as Hobbit. So how do you, how do you feel about doing this, Ed? How do you feel about um, narrating Hobbit? Uh, I'll be honest with you. It, it feels a little weird. I mean, I'm super honored. I love Netcat. I'm deeply grateful to Hobbit for his great work on it and all of the other contributions to the community that you cited. But I also feel a good deal of imposter syndrome here. I mean, I'm literally filling the role with permission as an imposter to Hobbit. Um, that's kind of humbling, a little scary. And I want everybody to know that this wasn't my idea. It was Mark Baggett's idea for me to do this. And we do it with Hobbit's permission, which we're grateful for. Uh, and I'm really thankful to be a conduit or, or a pipe <laughs> to convey Hobbit's words uh, for the InfoSec tool shed. But I do want to be very clear here. When we move to Hobbit mode for me in a little bit, I'm going to be using Hobbit's words to express Hobbit's ideas. I am not Hobbit nor am I claiming to be Hobbit or even pretending to be Hobbit. I appreciate and treasure his contributions to the community. For what I'm about to read as Hobbit, any resemblance to my own words or my own ideas is purely incidental. I'm going to do my best to accurately reflect Hobbit's own words and ideas in what comes next. It's not Ed talking. I'm reading to you what Hobbit has expressed. Does that make sense, Mark? Yeah, it does. And I appreciate that clarification. And actually, before you go into Hobbit mode, why don't you, as Ed, tell us a little bit about really what Netcat has meant to you and your career? Oh, that's it's been tremendous, really. It's uh, it's helped me on several fronts uh, throughout the last 20 plus years. Now, first off, I started penetration testing way back in 1996. I was working at Belcor uh, for the phone companies. And we would use Netcat all the time in our pen tests in those days. Uh, the 1.0 release of Netcat was in 1995. Uh, the 1.10 release came out in 1996, and we were using it right then and there. So from the very start of my career, 
Netcat was there and I could use it. Now we used it as a back door. We used it as an arbitrary client to make connections. We used it as a relay in our work in hacking the phone companies. You know, back in those days, we also relied on a port scanner called Strobe. This was written by Julian Assange. This was before Nmap came out, right? So we had this Strobe port scanner, we had Netcat, and sometimes our customers, the phone companies, would not allow us to use Strobe. Maybe it wasn't available, maybe we weren't allowed to install it, maybe it just didn't work on the given operating system because we had all these different Unixes. So we relied on Netcat. You know, you can use Netcat easily as a port scanner, and it's quite reliable. So I used it all the time in the beginning of my career. I also remember one time I, I was doing a penetration test and I was on this super stripped down minimalistic version of Linux. The entire Linux file system was less than 100 meg. This thing was so stripped down, it was missing a lot of fundamental commands. And this is a true story. It did not have the cat command to display a file. You couldn't cat a file. So I couldn't display a file on standard output. So I'm sitting there for a minute thinking to myself, I need to display the contents of a file. And I don't have cat. So I thought, well, let's try to tail the file. Nope, there's no tail. Try to head the file. There's no head command. Huh. There's netcat. NC. It's there. So I thought, well, what if I create a netcat listener, just listening on a port, whatever port, in one window. I'm going to have another terminal window, and I'll just netcat the file to localhost. So I'll pull the file in on standard input, then netcat it to localhost, so it shoots it out to my netcat listener, which then displays it on the screen. And it worked like a champ. So I could I could essentially CAD a file by simply netcatting it to localhost. Fun. I was also working on some incident response projects for the phone companies back in those days. This was in the late 90s. And I saw attackers building a series of netcat relays. And they would bounce from country to country to country. You know, they might start in this country. And then before that, they have another country, another country. And they'd be controlling their back doors across the internet. And they would bounce their connections to obscure where they were coming from. So I, I took this notion of netcat relays to bounce around networks and to actually wrap around and through different kinds of filtering mechanisms. And I added that to the SANS 504 course that I was uh, the author of at that time. And that brought the idea of netcat relays into the course. And I, and I started talking about other uses of netcat. And it really brought the idea of netcat relays to the widespread public's attention. So I added a whole bunch of information about the uses of netcat to my various SANS courses, a ton of hands-on exercises. And to this day, it remains one of the most helpful go-to tools in my arsenal. In fact, you know, I used to say to my SANS classes, imagine this scenario. You're stranded on a desert island, and you're allowed just one tool to hack your way off that island. Which tool would you choose? And I would say, it's probably going to be Netcat. I mean, there were other tools that might augment your use of Netcat that you could be helped you know, with over time. Some of them that you include in this whole uh, InfoSec tool shed. Uh, maybe for a certain time it was DSNF by Doug Song, or maybe sometime it was Metasploit, initially uh, pioneered by H.D. Moore. Um, but still, fundamentally, Netcat was going to be a piece of that arsenal for you to hack your way off that island. It's just an amazing tool, and it's been with me throughout my pen testing career. So with that, I guess we should probably get into uh, the origin story of Netcat. Are you are you ready to get get your Hobbit on? Uh, I I think so. Um, <laughs> With much trepidation, I say, let's do it. I will read um, my conversation and present the questions to you as I presented them to Hobbit. So with that, hello, Hobbit. Uh, it's my pleasure to speak with you, and I, I really appreciate you agreeing to do this. Sorry for the lag on all this. As I looked over your intro and framework, the task of creating a good write-up seemed to loom fairly large. I also wanted to go back and read my entire original readme again which I had not revisited in decades, probably. Much of what's in there is way out of date, but provides some interesting history about things the security community was thinking about and beginning to fix or eliminate. For example, does anything pass IP source routing anymore? Maybe a few core routers, but nothing that I touch daily. Yeah, no problem on the lag. I appreciate you talking to me at all. Although IP source routing is not nearly effective today, as it was back in the 1990s, Netcat has amazing longevity, and there's many features in there beyond just IP source writing. Uh, can you briefly introduce yourself and how you are related to Netcat? Yes, I've been Hobbit on the internet and uh, to all my work in social circles since about 1980. That was way before .com or .anything, of course, and I was already using systems connected to the then ARPANET 
on the day that everyone on it transitioned to the TCP IP protocol. Most of my career was around system management of some sort, doing machine configurations and operations for different groups of users. I spent several years at Rutgers in New Jersey and then moved to the Boston area in 1990. I never thought of myself as much of a coder, although I could dig in and understand existing code well enough to make small fixes. And one of my early security projects was around building fix kits for standard system tool package releases so other people could incorporate security enhancements before the original authors got around to fixing their real stuff, if they even agreed with what I changed. In the mid-90s, some of the classic network tools were appearing, such as Vietse Venema's TCP wrappers, Satan, updated email servers, and DNS tools. And we saw the rapidly growing bug hunting community starting to get really into trying to fix or rewrite old code to make it more solid. Netcat filled a need for me, and I figured it would help others simplify their own jobs as well. So it seemed worth putting together and releasing for free. I've always done a lot of volunteering around my community, so this was right in lockstep with my overall life philosophy before and since. What were you doing at the time that you wrote Netcat? I was actually working on a consulting project, making some improvements to the RSH Unix service, particularly around trying to integrate Kerberos and some other fixes. From that, I began understanding a lot more about the Sockets API and how the workhorse data transfer loop worked, and that core framework started to become an obvious component. The earliest version of Netcat that I've ever seen is 1.10. Were there earlier versions of that were, that were shared quietly on Usenet forums or IRC? There was very briefly a 1.0 Netcat and maybe even something in between. But by the time I had 1.10 out, I didn't see any urgent improvements that I wanted to make. So it's been 1.10 ever since, and I still use it as is to this day. Can you tell me when you first created Netcat? There's some history in the readme file itself, especially near the end in the credits section. Netcat drew most heavily from RSH for its main data transfer loop, simply because, as I mentioned, I was working on some enhancements to a Kerberized RSH environment as a consulting project at the time. The more I dug into that, the more I realized how NC's workhorse loop had to work. Satan and some other tools had emerged shortly before, around 1994-1995 timeframe. So much of the scanning techniques and logic around that were derived from those. I was never a fan of code built from scads of tiny files, so NC's code base became one monolithic, but still quite manageable source file. The point was to make it easy to build anywhere without having to grab other external libraries too. The Linux, quote, too many extra tiny library distros, quote, bloat, was already starting to happen around that time, and I hated it because having to find and install all those was a pain. The overall goal was to have a simple and reliable engine to script around, and you already touch on that in your intro. My default go-to for coding, even after all these years, is still to whack together a quick shell script calling other standard tools, sometimes the slowest and least efficient method, but for a one-off, who cares? If it does the job, I've been trying to teach myself a bit of Python lately, but not really doing much with it. A pile of scripts and aliases usually gets me through the day-to-day, -day, and I still spend most of my time in terminal shell windows. If I get more into trying to write smarter web service API stuff or endpoints other than static pages, I'll have to dig more into PHP and the like. To date, I have written exactly one piece of JavaScript, visible to most people at my techno fandom main index at techno-fandom.org slash tilde hobbit, where I distribute most of my stuff now. If you see a big red smoky bear, reevaluate your script blocker. You know, this seems like a great opportunity to mention that SANS SEC 573, Automating Information Security with Python, is this week's sponsor. A link to the course is in the description. How was 1.10 released for the first time? Where did you post it? I had a home server at avian.org, and back in the day, I ran a fixed-kitted anonymous FTP server on it. We didn't really have the web in a form that was usable to me at the time, and most code repositories were also FTP download sites. I tried writing a tiny web server around the same time, but its operation was too weird for a lot of people, so I stuck with FTP for distros. Early cuts of Netcat were probably sent to a couple of mailing lists, so a smallish audience at first. I had no idea that mainstream Unix distros would eventually pick it up. But in the Unix tradition of small but useful tools with short program names, 
I guess it had a lot of appeal. It wasn't the only one out there. There were a couple of other TCP Connect type tools, but they never quite took off the same way. What did you think when I, the first version of Netcat showed up in an operating system? I was initially astounded and rather pleased, as one might expect. My half-assed approach to coding turned out to be solid enough for those release managers, I guess, whether they reworked it or not. I figured that even if that was the only thing I ever really contributed, it was clearly being viewed as worthwhile on its own. Yeah, so today, today there's NCAT, PowerCat, uh, L2CAT, and perhaps a half a dozen other variations of NetCat that are out there. Uh, what do you think about inspiring this entire family of tools? I wish I had the time to keep track of all those variants, let alone try to merge some of those ideas back into my own source or guide developers who had misunderstood some aspect and screwed it up. To this day, I use other tools for things like SSL and TLS connections, having never integrated that into Netcat. Fyodor's NCAT handles encrypted TCP streams just fine, for example, even on Android. And that is already way past the development effort I'm willing to put in. So I definitely appreciate those other efforts. How did you decide to name the tool? Uh, and does it have any special significance? I, I'm assuming that it's cat and network, and you've just taken those two words and put it together. But is, is there any more significance to it than that? Well, again, the tiny program name Unix tool model, and yes, it was cat for the network that simply sent data without changing any of it. Well, with a minor exception of the Telnet muck, but Telnet servers were also rapidly disappearing in favor of SSH around the same time. Was there any blowback from security professionals, the community with the dash D gaping security hole option, the option that added the backdoor capabilities in there? I can't, I can't imagine compiling Netcat without it myself and often curse the BSD version of Netcat that's out there for leaving it out. But do you, do you have any stories related to adding that and how the community received it? Nobody actually complained about it as it was a clearly caveated option. And on systems where I found it absent, I simply built my own 1.10 and moved on. Of course, on some systems, I had to pull down the compiler first as it was increasingly not supplied by default. So that's sometimes annoying. See the rant about library and package bloat above. Can you share any memorable stories or incidents where the tool made a significant impact? Well, I've had random people tell me they use it every day in all kinds of ways, even fairly recently, but nothing really outstanding otherwise. Can you share any interesting anecdotes or experience related to the tool's development process? Well, I did a little consulting for BBN back when Mudge was working there. With relatively little in the way of firewalling at the time, we used to blast text over UDP into each other's syslog servers with priority zero, meaning, OMG, everything's on fire and it would spit out on our console. So it was our little fun pager for each other until we all started locking down better. That was early on before I'd added some of the other features, but even that baseline functionality made both of us start recognizing the power of these things. Did you anticipate the tool's popularity and widespread adoption, or is its success a surprise to you? As it appeared in more OS distros, it wasn't a surprise anymore, but still brought a bit of pride and the ability to guide other people toward using it to accomplish some task without having it to install anything. Once something becomes a standard, I guess it tends to stick around. I always felt sorry for the Windows users that they were never given some equivalent in the base OS to handle simple local network data transfers. Did you envision that your tool would have the long-term relevance when you initially created it? Mostly, yes unless something better came along to replace it. But folks who didn't need one of the follow-on variants or disagreed with how those variants handled subtleties like connection timing, just stuck with the original. Looking back on the tool's development journey, uh, what advice would you give to any aspiring developers who want to have the kind of success and make the kind of impact that you did in information security? Frankly, I've lost track of a lot of where things have headed in that area, at least at deeper levels of detail particularly with web-based services. For the most part, those pesky humans and the bad default configurations they design are the weakest link. A lot of the underlying frameworks that nobody ever thinks about anymore, such as kernel networking, baseline server code, have gotten greatly improved over the years, and that's kind of the level where Netcat lives. But here's a rant. These days, it's getting harder and harder to lock down one, one's own client-side stuff with the facilities we need to use insisting on so much potentially vulnerable local functionality and deliberately sending us off to tracking and demographics collection sites and other fluff. I do not forgive 
a single one of those, be it my bank or the news sites or online stores, for pulling stunts like that. So to developers, I would say try to reverse that trend. Try to simplify wherever you can and stop throwing random libraries and sketchy CDNs at us as a substitute for letting us run vetted code. No, it's not specifically a rant about development at the level of Netcat, but I still use Netcat with some really grody scripting to defend myself against many of those attempted intrusions into my personal life. So to the corporate sites that offshore to misguided development teams and think it's a good idea to willy-nilly add forced callouts to random code that you've never even read, see figure one. And that is how Hobbit ended our conversation. I, I love that he ended it with C figure one. And that was such a callback for me. And I was, uh, and initially I saw C figure one and I was like, C figure one. And my, my gears started turning and I seem to recall C figure one being this callback to this, this mythical illustration of the middle finger. If, if any of the people watching this have a better recollection of C figure one, then please do share that in the comments. I really uh, enjoyed my conversation with him and I appreciated him giving me the time to share the history of Netcat. And thank you, Ed, so much for coming on and being willing to put aside your magnanimous personality and take on that of Hobbit for, uh, for this interview. So thank you for that. I, I appreciate the invitation. It was a joy to do I loved when Hobbit went into rant mode. That, that was my favorite part. He gave us a couple of rants there. Uh, and I, I think they are largely accurate and, and worth thinking about. So uh, yeah. thank you to Hobbit for that. That's fantastic. Placing trust in places that we shouldn't has been a problem that we seem to repeat over and over and over again in this industry. And his rant is right on the mark. It's, it's interesting to think about this. You know, decades lead to quarter centuries, which lead to half centuries. I mean, we're, we're getting 30 years into Netcat pretty soon. And yeah, how about that? Yeah. And yet these problems persist.